one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Words taken from our epistle today, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> today we shall consider the deadly sin of schism. When God led the chosen people out of Egypt, he established Moses as their head. Previously, priestly functions were exercised by the leader of each family, regardless of tribe. But when God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai, he restricted the exercise of the priesthood to those Levites of Aaron's line. Now all the spiritual and temporal authority over the Israelites was concentrated in Moses and Aaron. After their failed and faithless attempt to enter the Promised Land, God condemned the Israelites to 40 years of wandering in the desert. Kor, a Levite, with Dathan and Abiron of the tribe of Reuben, seized this moment of discontent to stir up rebellion. Kor gathered 250 leading men of Israel together and complained against Moses and Aaron. He said, All the multitude consisteth of holy ones, and the Lord is among them. Why lift you up yourselves above the people of the Lord? He and his rebels also accused Moses of bad leadership. They said, Is it a small matter to thee? that thou hast brought us out of a land that flowed with milk and honey to kill us in the desert, except thou rule also like a lord over us? Kor and his followers took offense at an exclusive priesthood that only those approved by Aaron could offer sacrifice on behalf of the people and rejected the idea that God would appoint one man their sole ruler. After all, why should they have to obey Moses if someone else could lead them better? So they began to offer their own sacrifices to God as they had formerly been able to do. The sin of the rebellion of Kor was, first of all, one of schism. St. Cyprian says that they knew the same God as did the priest Aaron and Moses, living under the same law and religion, they invoked the one and true God, who was to be invoked and to be worshipped. So it was not a sin against faith. St. Cyprian continues to state that they transgressed by claiming to themselves the power of sacrificing, contradicting the order set by God, and thus sacrifices offered irreligiously and lawlessly, contrary to the right of divine appointment, could not be accepted nor profit them. Schism is the same sin for us as it was for the Israelites. While the head of the church is Christ, his vicar is the Pope, as the church is one visible body like the Israelites, so too it must have one visible head like Moses. If it needed a visible head in St. Peter appointed directly by Christ, then as the church is the same one as founded by Christ, it continues to need a visible head after Peter's death, his successor, the Pope. St. Thomas says, Schismatics are those who refuse to submit to the sovereign pontiff and to hold communion with those members of the church who acknowledge his supremacy. Schism is then quite different from heresy, the denial of any essential doctrine of the church. Although clearly the heretic has cut himself off from the church as well, and with it, all hope of salvation. Heresy is a sin against faith. The heretic actually has no faith, for he believes in a Christ of his own making, 
not the Christ who established the Catholic Church with the seven sacraments and her saving doctrines. It requires no virtue of faith to believe what fits the desires of our own mind, just as it requires no virtue of charity, of obedience, to follow only the rules which please us. Schism, then, is a sin against charity, as we are bound by charity to love and obey not only God, but those superiors he has set above us. While schism is distinct from heresy, St. Thomas says, as the loss of charity is the road to the loss of faith, so schism is the road to heresy. And St. Jerome writes that at the outset it is possible in a certain respect to find a difference between schism and heresy. Yet there is no schism that does not devise some heresy for itself that it may appear to have had a reason for separating from the church. We can see this quite clearly in those Eastern schismatics who would have us call them orthodox. Well, they are really heterodox as they reject papal supremacy, papal infallibility, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, purgatory, and so on. The practice of calling them orthodox a name that they have unjustly usurped is a recent one, a so-called polite fiction, so as not to give offense. But the utility of this should be questioned now more than ever. For if we wink eyes at such a grievous sin and play their little game by calling them orthodox, is this not to give a worse offense? to give scandal by which others are encouraged to treat a grave sin lightly? Now one might ask, is everyone who disobeys a commandment then a schismatic? No. The essence of schism is not simple disobedience to commandments, but rather rebellion. Some trusted Dominican moral theologians put it thus, Schism is a refusal to recognize the authority of the head of the church or to communicate with those subject to him. Thus, schism differs from disobedience to the head of the church or to particular prelates in the church, for one may disobey orders and still recognize the authority of him who gives the orders. Schism is when one disobeys, not because the thing ordered is difficult or because he fears that the individual will be unjust, but because he does not wish to recognize the authority of Pope in him who issued the judgment. But just as prolonged schism inevitably leads to heresy, how can prolonged disobedience not lead to schism? We might understand the claims of one who disobe disobeys an individual command given him because he believes the Pope has a personal hatred against him. But if he were to disobey a succession of popes, this argument would seem to weaken. Similarly, one might refuse obedience to a local bishop on the same grounds. But if he were to do this, bishop after bishop, then he would seem to be rejecting not the person of the bishop, not some sinful individual, but rather the office of bishop itself, the very belief that the church is a visible church, each diocese having its own visible head, all united together under the one supreme headship of the Pope. Think of a family. If the father were to command his son to work so much he never had time to pray, the son might disobey because it was too difficult. If the father were to command his son never to see his friend Joseph again, 
only because he hated Joseph's father, a son who disobeyed this order would not necessarily be denying his father's authority as father. But if the son disobeyed everything his father said, the very difficult things along with the very easy, the things motivated by an irrational hatred and those with no perceivable evil motive, if he just stopped listening to him entirely, making his own decisions as he liked, just as if his father didn't even exist. How long could he do this without actually saying that his father had no real authority over his children? Would it be any different for a priest who ministered in a bishop's diocese without ever obeying him or considering him a real authority? as the principal father of that diocese. What became of the rebellion of Kor? Moses condemned the rebels, and immediately the earth broke asunder under their feet, and opening her mouth, devoured them with their tents and all their substance. And they went down alive into hell, the ground closing upon them, and they perished from among the people. Just so the end of all schismatics and heretics, all those who have rebelled against the church, be they rebels against her saving teachings or against her ruling authority. Heresy may be a worse sin than schism, but both bring the soul to an eternity of suffering in hell. There can be no place in heaven for those who have cut themselves off from the saving body of Christ, the Church. There is but one Church, one body of Christ, one holy bride of Christ, and outside of this there is no salvation. What have we to do then? Before the destruction of Kor and his rebellion, Moses told the faithful Israelites, Depart from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be involved in their sins. Just as it is a sin to attend heretical worship, so too must we have nothing to do with any schismatics outside of seeking their conversion. We must cling to the only body that Christ has given us, the Church, to the rulers, the only rulers that God has permitted to be set over us. Our Lord never promised us that we would not have to suffer sinners in the Church, quite the contrary. He says that in the net, the church, are gathered good and bad fish. And again, that in the field, the church, there grow the wheat and the tares together. But it would be an insane idea to leave the one net, the one field, because of these evil fish and tares. God tried Israel by letting them wander 40 years in the desert. There was no salvation for those who departed from them, no promised land, even though Moses himself was not without sin. And after these years of hardship and trial, God led them through the leaders he appointed into the promised land to show us that so long as we remain faithful to Christ and obedient to the lawful authority he has set above us, we shall remain ever joined to him, members of his church in this life and then members of his elect in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>